The following brief has been created with open source information found in books as well as on the internet. However, do take it with a pinch of salt, however, as some aspects have been kept secret due to said country's official secrets act, or we just don't know, and sometimes the best place is actually Wikipedia. So with that said and done, let's get started with today's video. Right, so it's time for some Chinese warships. In today's video, we're going to be doing the Type 052 class, or as it's designated by NATO, the Luhu class. And this class would be the first class of modern guided missile destroyers that the People's Liberation Army Navy would actually construct. Designed by the China Warship Design Institute, formerly the 7th Academy of Ministry of Defence, the design would be drawn up and created, with two ships being ordered from the Zhangnan shipyard. The two ships would become the Harbin and the Qingdao. These vessels would displace 4,800 tons, be 144 meters long, 16 meters wide, and sit 5.1 meters in the water. They'd be powered by a Codog system of diesel engines and two gas turbines, powering two shafts at 55,000 shaft horsepower for 31 knots. Their range would be 5,000 nautical miles, 2,500 nautical miles less than a Type 23 frigate. But it's good to remember at this time, China was starting to build up and become a blue water navy, and they kind of had to start somewhere. The ships would be fitted with a lot of European equipment, ranging from the radars to sonars, as well as the IPS, or information processing system. So, the radars these ships would carry would be 1. Type 518 Haiying Early Warning Delta Band Radar, with an expected range of about 108 nautical miles. One. Type 362 Surface Search India Band Radar with an expected range of, again, 65 nautical miles. After the 2011 refit, however, the ships would don 1 Type 517 Mike Early Warning Radar with an expected Delta Band range and expected 140 nautical mile range, roughly, give or take. 1 Type 364 Golf slash Hotel Band Parabolic Radar. This has a range of about 86 nautical miles and has been associated to the ship's CIWS systems. The Harbin would don a DRBV-15 Sea Tiger Echo Foxtrot early warning radar with an estimated range of about 120 nautical miles. On the Qingdao, she would don a Type 360 Sierra Echo Foxtrot early warning radar with a maximum detection range of 135 nautical miles. Both ships would be fitted with the Type 345 Juliet Fire Control Radar for the HQ-7 surface-to-air missile system, with a range of about 30 kilometers against a 2 meter squared aircraft and 8.1 nautical miles against a sea-skimming target. Type 344 India Juliet Band Fire Control Radar for the Charlie 801 Sardine anti-ship missiles and the 100 mm gun. Range is estimated to be about 40 nautical miles. Two Rice Bowl India Band Fire Control Radars for the 37mm anti-aircraft guns. It too has the same range as the Type 345 Fire Control Radar. Two Decker 1290 India Band Navigational Radars with a range of about 25 nautical miles. Now we get on to the sonars. So they would carry the DUBV-23 medium frequency hull mounted sonar, the DUBV-43 towed array sonar. And that's it. That's the sonars. Now let's move on to the weapons. The ship's following weapons fits would be as follows. Four quad Charlie 801 or Charlie 802 subsonic anti-ship missiles with an active seeker head. These have a range of between 64.8 nautical miles and 103 nautical miles. One 8L HQ-7 service-to-air missile system with 16 spare missiles. This missile has a speed of Mark 2.3 out to a range of 8.1 nautical miles. One dual 100mm 56 caliber gun expected to have a range of 11.3 nautical miles against surface contacts. Two type 7424 324mm YU7 anti-submarine warfare torpedoes. 7 type 
7.30, seven barrel knockoff goalkeeper, 30mm closing and weapon systems, with an effective range of 0 0.8 nautical miles. Finally, two Type 87 six tube anti submarine warfare rockets. Expected range is about 800 nautical miles. So, that's a lot of radars, sonars, and weapons. But they can also carry jammers, decoys, and helos. She also carries the Type 984 Echo Band Jammer, as well as two Type 946 15 barrel decoy or chaff launchers. Last of all, because the Wafus will uh, get a little bit annoyed when you don't mention the helos as a weapon system, the ships can carry two KA 27 Helix helicopters or a Harbin Z9 Charlie. So leaving all those weapons, sensors and god knows what else behind, we're going to continue on and talk about the careers. So, no order date or key or lane dates have been found, but what we do know is the ships were launched between August 28th 1991 and October 18th 1993, with commissioning between May 8th 1994 and the 28th of May 1996. So, as you probably guess, I'm going to let you into a little theme. So, when it comes to Chinese warships, especially around about the 1990s, it's actually quite hard to get any information on these vessels because of the secret nature of the Chinese government and their dissemination of information. So, unfortunately, for this entire video, I've actually had to get all my information from Wikipedia because every single other source I find basically is of Wikipedia. And when it comes to the book I have on the, the second generation of Chinese warships book, it doesn't really have much in it. So unfortunately, most of this is going to come off Wikipedia. And as such, from now on, I am literally going to quote Wikipedia because there's nothing really much else to go on. So coming from the Americans, the American military did an analysis on the ships after one of the vessels actually went into their port. Now, a few analysts went on board, and it quotes, The operational capability of the Luhu class destroyers has been called into question by naval analysts. Ship visits in 1997 allowed US naval officers on board to inspect the Luhu destroyer number 112, the Harbin, and to take numerous photographs. Analysis of these photographs and reports by officers present strongly suggests that the Luhu destroyers were mainly intended as technology demonstration vessels rather than serious naval combatants. For example, the large amount of foreign supplied equipment on board was still labelled in the language of the country of origin. This was also the case with most of the onboard manuals and other documentation. This calls into question the ability of the crew to operate effectively under stressful circumstances when called upon in dealing with equipment labelled in English, French, Italian, as well as Chinese. Furthermore, the various European systems installed were not originally designed to operate together and as a result were not well integrated. A problem that the Chinese could not overcome owing to the lack of familiarity with underlying technologies. The Chinese attempted to address these problems with the introduction of the improved Luhu design, the Lu High class. This follow-on, essentially an enlarged Luhu, features some improved electronics from foreign suppliers as well as more advanced weapons. However, in some cases, the designers appear to have opted for less capable indigenous designs to ease the system integration issues suffered on the Luhus. The plan was reportedly unhappy with the design of Lu Hai, and the production ceased after the single unit was completed. So to go off a uh, piece and script here, I'm going to basically waffle on for a little tiny bit here. So in essence what they're saying is, the ships were not exactly the best combatants per se. The more of the technological demonstration vessels, because don't forget China at this point was operating with, well, ships that literally look like they've just come out of 1950. And it's come into question that maybe some of those weren't that great. And I think with this being the first vessel that China's actually tried to mass produce, yeah, it comes to the point where you kind of try to make it good, but it's it's like it's like stepping stones. 
and I feel that these vessels were kind of the stepping stone to improvement. They're not great, they're pretty much terrible, but you know, it's... Look at some of the newer things, they're a lot better than these. I feel that these are kind of the stepping stone to greatness, per se. So going back onto uh, kind of the script here. So these ships would operate around the Asia area, as well as going further afield to places like Pacific to fly the Chinese flag. Now this was kind of the idea of a goodwill mission to basically show off uh, basically China's new toy, as most countries do these days. But these ships would also be part of the NEF, or Naval Expeditionary Force, and these would go out to the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Gulf and basically act as a deterrent force against Somali pirates and protecting Chinese flagged vessels, sailing up to the BAM, as well as basically going back to China. And that's what they would do for roughly every six months and then rotate with other vessels of the Chinese fleet. Now by 2011, however, they would have a sizable upgrade with many radars being upgraded as well as the tactical communication systems being upgraded so they actually could be operated, which is kind of a good thing when you've got a warship. Aside from that, however, the communication systems were upgraded for off-board communications as well as the addition of SATCOM antennas and, to some certain extent, more weapons and better operational capability all around. After 2011's uh, refit, the operational history that we do know is the Qingdao in February 2012, along with a Type 054 Alpha frigate, the Yantai, and a supply ship formed the 11th Chinese Naval Escort Force, or NEF, and left the city of Qingdao to conduct counter piracy patrols in the Gulf of Adan and Somali waters. A year later, herself and a Type 053 Hotel 3 class frigate, the Nam Yang, as well as the same supply ship, formed the 14th NEF and proceeded from Qingdao to the Gulf. In October, she would participate in the International Fleet Review of 2013 in Sydney. Now, current open source intelligence suggests that both ships are still active with the North Sea Fleet, not the British North Sea Fleet, the Chinese North Sea Fleet, and there's no information if they are to get rid of them anytime soon or if they're going to be upgraded with better radars, weapons, and combat systems. Thank you very much for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. Before you go, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel to stay up to date with my latest videos, as well as commenting, and if you want to, subscribe to the Patreon page to support the channel. All I need to say is, here's a sneak peek at next week's video.